All right, guys, Wednesday, we're going to cover three sections in Tuesdays with Maury today. We're going to cover two of the Tuesdays. Um, each of these are kind of different than the last ones we covered. They both are, are covering important topics, but there's a lot of narrative elements to these that we really won't go over into much detail. And then there's a few really important uh, topics to discuss. Then we also have the third audiovisual. Uh, Mitch Album uses each of those audiovisual sections to mark a change in tone in this book. <clears throat> After the third one, we definitely are on the end of this book. And it definitely goes from, um, you know, the beginning we have the uh, for the first audiovisual sets up who Maury is, and it sets up all the, you know, a little bit of humor and the fun of the first little bit. Then after the second one, the middle part gives us a lot of the really heavy topical material. And the third part's going to be focused on him saying goodbye and his death and what happens afterwards. All right. And it's really hard, but uh, it's really good, too. So the two today, not as big of a deal, though. OK, so let's look at them. The first one is the 10th Tuesday. And we talk about marriage. All right. Now, for most of you in this room or for all of you probably watching this, unless one of your parents is over your shoulder, this is not a uh, topic that you really think much about. Uh, you're young. 15, 16 years old. Marriage isn't really something that crosses your mind a lot, although it's probably starting to, you know, develop a little bit as you start thinking about what you want in a spouse and observing what other people have. So the first part of the narrative element of this is just that Mitch brings his wife with him to meet Maury. Maury's been asking to meet her for a while. Mitch's wife is a singer um, and a professional, if I remember right. And uh, it's just a tender scene where Maury asks her to sing for him, something that Mitch points out she never does. And then all of a sudden she actually does it for him. And he points out when she finished, Maury opened his eyes and tears rolled down his cheeks. In all the years I've listened to my wife sing, I never heard her sing the way she did at that moment. So it's just this image again of how Maury brings out the best in people. And there are people like that. And guys, I hope that you find some to put to surround yourself by around in your life because um there's not a lot of them. I mean, most people bring out the worst in us. You know, it's one of the things I've learned as a teacher that, you know, one of the, the most of the lessons I learned in uh, when I had to go back and get my teaching degree, because, you know, I got a degree in English and I went back and got my teaching degree. And uh, one of the lessons, little slide things they told us, most of what they told us was nonsense. It, it was really stupid. But one of the things they told us was to avoid the teacher's lounge at all costs. And I was like, what does that mean? They don't want us to fellowship with our fellow teachers. And it wasn't that. It was because a majority of people, and not everybody, and kind of chills blessed not to have as bad a grouping of this as, as most schools. But a lot of teachers want to use that time to gripe and complain. And I know I've been guilty of it at times. You know, you always want to sit and talk about, you know, which kid's not doing your work or which parent's giving you the hardest time. And you do all of this, and it just kind of poisons you toward the other teachers towards those people. Um, because a lot of times that parent that's giving that teacher a hard time isn't really giving that teacher a hard time. Um, or there's a misunderstanding and the teacher the teacher just doesn't understand what the parent's trying to do. Or that student who's not doing the work is not quite as belligerent as, as they're made to believe. Uh, so there's so many things about we just sit there and, and you start griping about your class. And so then this other teacher starts to, has to one up you and show you why theirs is worse. And before long, you leave after that 20 minutes of sitting at lunch feeling really bad about yourself. It's one of the things I love right now about us having that group where we sit at the table down there in the lunchroom, because rarely is that the case. We usually all sit and joke and have a good time. Occasionally some really, you know, rather difficult conversations come up and I usually just leave. Uh, I make an excuse to go grade papers or something. So, um, it's important to surround yourself with positive influences, especially as there's less and less of them around. All right. Um, there goes everything falling. All right. So uh, we move into the next section, though, and this is kind of the, the meat of this chapter. It says marriage. Almost everyone I knew had a problem with it. Some had problems getting into it. Some had problems getting out. My generation seemed to struggle with the commitment as if it were an alligator from some murky swamp. I had gotten used to attending weddings, congratulating the couple, and feeling only mild surprise when I saw the groom a few years later sitting in a restaurant with a younger woman whom he introduced as a friend. You know, I was separated from so-and-so, he would say. Why do we have such problems? I asked Maury about this. Having waited seven years before I proposed to Janine, I wondered if people my age were being more careful than those who came before us or simply more selfish. Um, so Mitch kind of establishes the problem, and I think he's, he's right on. Um, our, you know, our culture right now has a huge issue with marriage. I, I would almost say it's hostile towards it. 
Um, you know, you see things about affairs in movies and TV, like they're very, like not even a big deal. They show up on sitcoms and stuff, kind of like a joke. Um, you know, people almost tease you for being in a committed marriage where you're actually happy. You don't see stuff. I mean, it is just such a running gag that, you know, in a marriage that they're just, people are unhappy after they've been in it for a while. And that's just, that's sad. Um, you know, part of, I think a lot of the problem we have in our world is that the TV shows and the movies and stuff dictate what we think life really is. And, you know, we know deep down that that's not the reality, but we don't live that way. So we just think cheating on people is a normal behavior, or we think being unhappy in your marriage is a normal behavior, or not discussing things is normal behavior. We have all of these things we normalize that shouldn't be. Um, and Mitch points out that he doesn't know if they're being more careful, which is what a lot of people tell themselves. When we wait so long to get married because we're, um, you know, because we're waiting for the right person, and that's a good idea. But a lot of us, that's not the case. A lot of us, you hear a lot of other people say, well, I'm trying to get my career going and I'm trying to become stable financially before I get married, which that's a good idea on the surface. And for some people, <coughs> that's the route to go. <coughs> the problem is, is getting married and having kids are two things that you're never totally ready for. You're just not. There's never a time where it's a good time for that for most of us, because if you do get that career started and you're doing good in it, well, you're going to be busy with that. And it's hard to take time off to go and have um, you know, that, a honeymoon or in that early days of the marriage to really you know, build that bond that you need to build. Um, so the, the concept of there's a perfect time for this, there's a perfect time in God's eyes, but our culture's eyes is really not. That, that doesn't exist. Um, he also points out, well, I feel sorry for your generation, Maury said. In this culture, it's so important to find a loving relationship with someone because so much of the culture does not give you that. Poor kids today, either they're too selfish to take part in a real loving relationship or they rush into marriage and then six months later they get divorced. They don't know what they want in a partner. They don't know what they are themselves. So how can they know what they're marrying? And that's really the heart of it. And you know what? He's not wrong. It's like, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's these two opposite uh, ways of going about this. One, you rush into marriage. You, know, you met the person, I'm in love, and you, you go with that initial high of how everything's great and this person's the one I need to be with in six months, you know, you're married, you're at the altar, and then you're divorced when you really start to learn about this person and know that you're just not as compatible as you thought. Or you're doing that whole, you know, being overly picky. Now, guys, you shouldn't just settle for whatever comes your way, all right? Understandable. But also, especially the older you get, the more we start to want that, you know, well, this is my idea of the perfect woman. And the problem is that we ignore the fact that adjective there, perfect, and perfect doesn't exist. You know, everybody's got their issues. Um, you know, we're there to lean on each other. You know, Mitzi and I both have some, me more than her, have some issues that we have to struggle with. Uh, you know, when we first got married, I was not good with the finances. I'm still not great, but I'm much better uh, about saving and not overspending. <clears throat> but when we first got together, I wasn't that way. And we had to work through that. Uh, she's very closed off. She's she's not the most open person. So she'll be upset with me and I won't know about it until, you know, weeks later when it blows up and she unloads nine things on me. And I told we had to work through that because that's not how I, I work. So but we've had to work through those things. And uh, that's it. Marriage is hard. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Every every moment of it's worth it. And that's even the hard times. And that's kind of what Maury's pointing out in this chapter. Um, and he points out there, it's necessary. You need someone like this in your life. He, uh, so Mitch asks him, you know, this is one of the few times Mitch does this. It's very naive of him. He's like, well, what are some rules for a good marriage? Well, you know, you can't just codify this into simple rules. There's so much more to it than that. It depends on you. It depends on the person. It depends on the situation. But Maury does give him a few, like, generic, very broad rules that I think are actually really good. He says, uh, there are a few rules I know to be true about love and marriage. If you don't respect the other person, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you don't know how to compromise, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you can't talk openly about what goes on between you, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And if you don't have a common set of values in life, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Your values must be alike. So he gives you four rules there, and they're all pretty solid. You know, the first one is you have to respect the other person, and, by, and that, 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 that's such a broad thing. And, you know, what does that mean? Well, it depends on your relationship, okay? Um, he says you have to know how to compromise, and that's a big one. And both so the thing is for this to, for marriage to work, both sides have to pull this off. See, you're responsible for fifty percent of it. You can handle your end of it. You, you can't always make the other person follow it, and that's where there's some issues. You know, um, 
you know, respect. You know, you can, I respect my wife greatly. I respect what she does for my family. I respect what she does at work. Um, I think there's times where, you know, and she respects what I do, but I think there's times during the summer where that's not the case. And that's some of the times we have our biggest fights. It's hard for her to get up on uh, my assistant's back. It's hard for her to get up at 5 a.m. In, in July and go to work knowing that, you know, by that point, I'm already getting depressed because I'm not I'm not working. I'm, I mean, I'm still getting paid, but I'm not working. Uh, I'm sitting around the house. I'm, I've gotten bored with just making up lesson plans and trying to come up with stuff. I've gotten kind of in this funk where I just kind of, you know, I'll sleep until about eight. I'll get up. I'll have coffee. I may read a little bit and I'll sit and watch TV or wander around the house. And I don't even know where the hours go in July. And she'll come home and I've done nothing but make a bigger mess. And she gets pretty frustrated. And uh, it's hard for her to understand what I'm going through because she works hard all the time. Um, I have nine months of hard work and then I have three total. And that's not just in the summer. That's all together where I'm not working and she doesn't get that. Uh, most most uh, spouses of teachers don't. So there's a there's an issue we th we had to have it a while back about that a uh, respect thing. I had to respect her beliefs and I had to respect I had to get up and do stuff. You know I couldn't trash the house that sort of thing. Um, of course compromise we're good at that both of us are good at good compromisers. Uh, talking openly about what goes on between you again that's a very key thing. You can't be mad and expect the other person's going to figure out why you're mad. They they won't. Okay. I mean, you need to be able to sit down in a calm and loving way and explain, hey, look, it makes me feel bad when you do this. All right. And then finally, he talks about a shared set of values. And that's biblical, guys. I mean, that's the whole idea about not being yoked with an unbeliever. It doesn't just mean an unbeliever is a person who doesn't like church. They mean by a person who's not got the same values and beliefs you do. <coughs> not just, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Not just their religious beliefs, but their beliefs about other stuff, too. It's really hard. We see a lot of divorces because people don't have common sets of values. How much value do you put on certain things? I mean, in my family, jo the jobs are important. The jobs don't define us. They're not the most important thing. I mean, my wife has told me multiple times if I've come home and I'm having a rough day, if you're not happy, we can find something else. It's never a, well, you just better suck it up and deal with it because we got to pay the power bill. It's never been that way here. Um, and I'm the same way with her. If she's really miserable, I'm like, so we, we look somewhere else and we do something else. Um, you know, that's important. You know, having shared values about how you're going to raise children, uh, about, you know, are you going to be one of the parents who's very authoritarian and tells them, Hey, look, you're going to do this. And is very strict. Are you going to be a little bit more open with them? All of these types of things are, are things that you have to agree on. Um, or there's going to be problems. All right. And then he points out, <laughs> Maury's idea is the biggest of those values is the importance of your marriage. You know, how, how much time do you think you should spend together? That sort of thing. All right. Um, and Maury goes on to point out how important he thinks marriage is and that everyone should do it. And without it, you're really missing out on a major part of life. Okay. All right. So that ends the 10th Tuesday that they talk about marriage. We go into the 11th one now, which is where they talk about culture, which they've talked about culture throughout this book. Maury has a very strong disdain for our culture. That's for sure. The narrative element here is not that useful to, to, for our discussion. It's just talking about we, we see how more he's getting worse. Um, and there's a little bit of a joke about grading. And then we move into the meat of this chapter, too. And this one I love. It's more believed in the inherent good of people, but he also saw what they could become. And I, that is that's the way to do it. All right. You know, you don't want to be naive and believe that all people are inherently good. All right. But, you know. You also don't want to think that humanity is trash, and it's hard not to because the media presents that. You know, I remember the first few days of this pandemic watching the news and seeing the worst examples of people beating each other up for toilet paper <coughs> or fighting over a bottle of hand sanitizer or everyone telling on everyone else for the smallest little details. My wife last night told me that, you know, I had gotten up yesterday to go to Target. I had to get a few things. And uh, I didn't wear a mask or anything. I, I, I don't cough on people. I, I, I'm very cognizant not to cough when I'm in the store. Even if I have to, I just kind of hold it in until I get outside because I don't want to scare people or make them think, oh, my goodness, he's sick, which I'm not. I have allergies, and I cough in the mornings all the time. Um, but uh, we got home, and my wife showed me a Facebook posting by some lady who was griping because she had been sitting at Target that morning seeing all of these people go in without masks and how should they, we were the problem. Now I'm not saying she was directly referencing me, 
But my thing is, is that's an example of how we can look at humanity and say, humanity is such garbage. I mean, why does it, what is this woman getting out of getting on Facebook and ranting about everyone not wearing masks? You know, that's not doing anything. First of all, my wife's a nurse and she tells me how ineffective that is. She's like, you can wear them. And it, it, does it help a little? I guess. But I mean, half the people wearing them are just taking those germs home anyway. <clears throat> you know, and uh, it's it's not as safe as you would think it is, especially not the masks most of us wear. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? No, of course not. Safety is important. Um, I didn't go anywhere near another human being while I was in Target. <laughs> OK, I mean, the war, I was going to have more of an issue with touching things that people had been um, sneezing on or something, uh, which is an issue all the time. And, uh, you know, so I didn't wear gloves and stuff, but we don't have any. Um, they're not as easy to come by as you would think. But everybody's on there ranting and raving about this and everybody's complaining about people being out when they're not supposed to, when they don't know what people are doing. So there's a lot of this kind of stuff. And it really makes you I mean, I've had I've struggled with just being. I, I want to live in the woods away from all people because I just don't like them anymore. And uh, that's been an issue. Um, so uh, Maury believes that people deep down are good, but he knows they also can become bad because of situations. And that's the I feel like that's 100 percent correct. Uh, and, and again, one of my favorite paragraphs in the book right here, he says, people are only mean when they're threatened, he said later on. And that's what our culture does. That's what our economy does. Even people who have jobs in our economy are threatened because they worry about losing them. And when you get threatened, you start looking out only for yourself. You start making money a god. It's all part of this culture. And he exhaled, which is why I don't buy into it. You could have an entire class period on that one paragraph. Because he's 100% right. And I never really pieced that together that way until I read it. I knew it was true, but I didn't have it in words until I read this part. And he is so right. Um, our culture makes people mean. It's way too competitive. Um, and it's not just competitive in a good way. Competition's good if it brings out the best in you. If it brings out the worst in you, it's not good. Okay, so like if you're a competitor <clears throat> in sports, you lose the championship, you lose the big game, and it makes you get up on the, during that summer and work harder so that you can be stronger so you don't lose the next one, then that competition's a good thing. If the competition, you lose the big game and it causes you next year to take steroids or to cheat during the game and stuff. Now that's not a good thing. And it depends on the person for sure. But our culture makes people feel threatened because so many people are the second, not the first. All right. If you're at a job and I've dealt with this guys, in some ways I feel like I deal with this still on days. But if you're at a job and you know, there's another person there, like for we'll use my example. Let's say I'm a, a new teacher comes in. And this teacher is, you know, all the kids like this teacher. And this teacher seems to have, you know, they're young, they're exciting, they, they're doing new things. And you start to feel a little threatened. Uh, you know, you feel like, oh, no, they're going to, uh, they're going to, the, if I can't do what they're doing, I'm going to lose my job. So the right thing here is to, say, to go to that teacher and say, hey, look, I'm really, I'm, 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 being, I'm noticing what you're doing. How is it you become, how can you, like, maintain the balance? You know, you're so close to the kids, yet you also have established that you're the teacher. Um, I'm not great at that. Can you help me with that? And can, you know, how can I implement some of the stuff you do in my classes? Because <clears throat> I'm really impressed with you as a teacher. That's what we should do. But that's not what we do. We go to lunch and when somebody says, you know, hey, I hear Mr. So-and-so has been, you know, the kids really like him. And you're like, yeah, but that's probably because he doesn't really give them much in the way of work. I've seen what they do. It's not that impressive. Or, yeah, but I've heard he uh, gets off topic a lot and doesn't really stick on any one thing. Uh, and you know how it is when kids like teachers, blah, blah, blah. You know, you start doing that naysaying and talking bad about people. And that's what we'll do a lot of the time. We'll tear that person down, hoping that it'll kind of catch on and you'll maintain your spot. So there's that competitiveness in your job that makes our, our culture just fosters that it teaches us to be that way and then he even mentions the economy and that's that kind of goes with your job by the way but i mean he talks about our, our economy is that way and yes that is kind of a direct attack on capitalism okay he's not a socialist like i said you're not one or the other um i believe in the competitive element of capitalism i think we should ha have a, the freedoms we do so that you know that's it's hey are you okay come on let's get out sorry guys uh i think that it makes sense on paper, but I also think there is when we get too too competitive. Sorry, my cat has asthma. Um, 
I also believe that it, it can make it where our competition breeds businesses like GameStop, which is a horrible business, which is built around profit 100%. And a lot of you make, there's jokes about it. If you're a video gamer, you know this place. But I mean, what they do to their employees is criminal. And then you can watch videos about or, or learn about places like Lowe's and Walmart who also treat their employees terribly. So, <clears throat> the, but what do you do? You have to deal with it. Because if not, you lose your job, and then you're just going to have to go to another bad company and work. So we just learn to accept these things. More, he's like, that's where people develop this nastiness, is because they're made that way. They're not born that way. Our culture forces them down that road. And he says the way you fix that is you just don't buy into it. You know, you become that teacher who sits down at the lunch table and says good things about people. And guys, I try to remind myself to be that way. And I got to be honest with you, I am not a lot of the time. I try to be positive. When this pandemic started, I went out of my way to be positive with the other teachers when they started gloom and dooming about how we were never going to come back to school and all this other stuff. And I was like, no, look, this is going to be fine. We go through rough stuff sometimes. And I tried to say all those things. Um, I know I didn't do it as well as I should have, but I worked on it because I felt like we needed a voice that was being positive. Uh, you can't buy into what the culture tells you. Our culture is not a thing of God. It's not a godly thing. Our culture is very much so of the world and very much so of the devil, to be honest with you. It is not uh, what it should be. It teaches uh, you to be unhappy with yourself and with others. Um, and it teaches you to be discontented with everything um, what, that you own. It, it just is, it's everything about it screams, stay away, to be honest with you, if you really want to be, be a sane person. All right. Um, See, there's a couple more passages. Maury says that what you have to do is you have to build your own subculture. You know, instead of buying the culture that's given to you, you create your own. So here's what I mean by building your own little subculture. I don't mean you disregard every rule of your community. I don't go around naked, for example. I don't run red lights. The little things I can obey, but the big things, how we think, what we value, choose those yourself. You can't let anyone or any society determine those for you. And there's just some of the best advice you can have in this book, <clears throat> especially for a young person who's just now developing into what our world it has for you. Um, follow the little rules that you have to, but the big stuff is up to you, all right? You're, the, our culture can't tell you what you're supposed to value. And in fact, the stuff it tells you to value, don't, all right? Build your own what you value. If you value family more than a job and you decide, hey, look, you know what? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to take that promotion. I keep working where I, where I am and not go uh, up higher. You know, the idea that that's what we're all supposed to do is keep moving up the ladder. Maybe you don't buy that. Maybe you say no, because when, the farther up the ladder you go, the less time you have, you less time you have for um, <coughs> the, the things that you do care about. OK, um, I've joked around with my with uh, all one of our old principals. Mr. Anderson always would ask me about, you know, when I was going to go back and get my uh administrative degree and move up to be an assistant principal or principal because he told me he thought I'd be really great at it. I told him I don't want to work all year around. I, I want to have, you know, I mean, I, I like working, but I don't want to work that hard all year round. It talks about what I value is not the position and the prestige of being a, an administrative person. I like my classroom. I like having a real, I don't want to be a person. Who, I, I know Miss Richardson struggles with this. Now, most of the time when you, you guys have all these negative opinions of her because you see her only when you're in trouble. I mean, she doesn't get to just hang out with you guys like I do in a classroom and tell you how much she cares about you because she's limited. Uh, it's not her fault. That's what her job is. But she's not the bear you guys all think she is. There's so much more to her. But, you know, if you're only seeing her during disciplinary parts, you know, that kind of stinks. Is it better pay than I get? Sure. I I'm assuming. Um, is it uh, more prestige? Yes. Um, but you sacrifice a lot to do it. She knows that I because mean, she's a teacher at heart. Uh so Maury's saying basically what you have to do is you have to decide what's important. You have to live to that. And if culture tells you that, that, that you're wrong, who cares? You don't care what culture thinks. Build your own. Determine it for yourself. He says every society uh, – and Mitch asked him, why don't you just leave? Because this is – American culture is not a good culture. It's one of the worst in the world, I believe. You know, it, it really makes us mean people. Um, you know, it, it does – it downplays the role of the family. It mocks, you know – Christianity and faith. Um, it, it does every, everything that, you know, I seem to care about. It, it tears down. Uh, you know, it tells you the, the greatest thing is the dollar. That's what's the most important. You got to have the big good job. Got to have the big house. Got to be the best on the block. Got to be the highest position. And, you know, we hide that behind that and say that's because it's trying to teach us to be our best, but it's not. For a lot of us, it's teaching us to be our worst. And um, 
some bitch is like, well, why don't you just move to another country? There are other places that aren't like that. I mean, you can move to some places where that culture is not built on that at all. But Maury points out something really, really key here. He says, every society has its own problems. Uh, the way to do it, I think, isn't to run away. You have to work at creating your own culture. He points out, you can move to other countries. There's a lot of countries in Europe that aren't as driven as ours, but they have other issues. He's like, it doesn't matter where you go. You're still going to have culture telling you the wrong thing. He says, look, no matter where you live, the bigger defect we human beings have is our short-sightedness. We don't see what we could be. We should be looking at our potential, stretching ourselves into everything we can become. But if you're surrounded by people who say, I want mine now, you end up with a few people with everything and a military to keep the poor ones from rising up and stealing it. So the problem, Mitch, is that we don't believe we are as much alike as we are. Whites, blacks, Catholics, and Protestants, men and women. If we saw each other and it was more alike, we might be eager to join in one big human family in this world and to care about that family the way we care about our own. And I'm skipping a little bit, but I love this last part. He says, in the beginning of life, when we were infants, we needed each other to survive, right? And at the end of life, when you get like me, you need others to survive, right? His voice dropped to a whisper. Here's the secret. In between, we need others as well. He's really pointing out the key to building this subculture is realizing that you need other people, but you need good other people. And that to realize that we're a lot more similar than we think we are. You know, we like to focus on our differences. And he says, we're really not. You know, when we look at it at the end of the day, we all want a lot of the same things. And that we should treat that as... Um, Sorry, I got a dog snoring in there. We should treat that as, as, you know, what we focus on, okay? All right, so that chapter ends, and then we get, and I'm going to, I'm running long again. This is a common thing for me. We get the audiovisual part three. It's very short, okay? It's just Ted Koppel comes back to visit Maury this final time, and Maury's in really bad shape, and you can tell it's really bothering Koppel. These, these two have become friends in a way, um, and Koppel really admires Maury a lot, and uh, just... He, he tells him, he says, hey, if you can't do the show, I'm going to come visit you anyway. Um, I'm still going to come by and see you. Uh, this is not, he doesn't push him into doing this, even though it would be a ratings bonanza. Because for Nightline, these Maury episodes were some of their highest rated. Um, he knows it would be good for his show, but he also knows that he doesn't want to force him to do this. All right. Um, he asks Maury, basically, they get to the conversation about death and how it's, they know it's coming for him. It says, for me, Ted, living means I can be responsive to another person. It means I can show my emotions and my feelings, talk to them, feel with them. He exhaled. When that is gone, Maury's gone. Maury points out that, you know, that's how he'll know it's time, is when he can no longer interact with other people and, and be there for them. I mean, what an unselfish human being. I mean, got to be one of the most unselfish that ever lived, to be honest with you. Um, since he told Copley he wanted to die with serenity, he shared his latest aphorism. Don't go too... Don't let go too soon, but don't hang on too long, which that's a really, uh, there's a lot of depth to that, believe it or not. Um, and then this is the last thing he met, leaves with the people who watch this. So before this book came out, this was his final message to, you know, the, to America. It says, be compassionate, Maury whispered, and take responsibility for each other. If we only had learned that lesson, the world would be so much better of a place. It tells him right away, take responsibility for each other. Stop saying it's not my problem. Stop saying, looking at people who are upset and hurting and walking past them. Take responsibility for each other. Stop, whether there's your friend or whether it's not. Just if you see a kid in the hallway who's upset, stop and talk to him. Um, one of the memories I will have of this year uh, is from, it was it's a recent memory. Um, I got upset in, 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 in my first period of class. The kids were being terrible. Um, I'd had enough. There was like probably a minute until the bell rang. And I was like, you know what? I, I can't be in here right now. I said, if this is how y'all are going to behave and you're going to act, I cannot be in here. I walked out and, and I needed to go to the bathroom anyway. So I walked down to the bathroom. And I don't do this a lot. But this was just one of those moments where it felt right. Walk in the bathroom and I see a student in there who's been crying. All right. You don't see guys crying a lot. This is a freshman. I don't teach freshmen. I don't have a relationship with this kid. I know who he is. But uh, I stopped and, and said, hey, man, what's going on? Are you all right? And took some time to talk to him. I know that, that when I have this kid as a junior, uh, we're going to have a really good relationship just because of that one moment. To take the time to stop and ask him, hey, are you okay? And he wasn't. And we talked about it for a few minutes. Um, it was the right thing to do. Now, shouldn't have left my classroom. Uh, I understand that. The bell rang as I was walking to the bathroom. So, um, But 
it was one of those moments where I had an opportunity. I could have just said, hey, man, uh, you good? And said it in a way that un- that he understood I didn't really want to talk about it and left because it wasn't my problem. But the fact is, is that everything's our problem. We have to take responsibility for each other and care for each other. And that's the point he makes. Uh, then there's this really interesting scene at the end. They said that the, the recorder let the tape keep rolling. And you get this scene of, of Ted Koppel telling Maury he did a good job. And Maury basically, you know, needing that affirmation and even mentioning that he's been praying lately, which Maury's an atheist. Okay. Uh, th- this is one of those interesting things to point out to people is that, you know, you know, it's not just Christians that have morals. Uh, in fact, a lot of Christians have pretty rotten morals. Um, but uh, more he's one of the most moral people there are. And he he didn't believe in God, and I'm not going to say there's not this big death death uh, scene where he accepts Jesus and gets saved. I, I, you know that, that's not in this book, but you can tell he's definitely thinking about God. Now, he doesn't understand, you know. Uh, well, he's Jewish, so he may have a different viewpoint of God than Christians do. But he does uh, ask if he gets to be an angel, which of course that's really not how that works, but. Uh, it's kind of this this tender scene where Ted Koppel's saying goodbye to his friend here. Um, and we're going to get a lot of that over the next few chapters. Very sad, very much of a tearjerker of a book. It, it's going to pull at your heartstrings as we close out, all right? Okay, uh, 31 minutes, so this is a good stopping spot. I'd like to talk more about it, um, but, you know, I can't. So you see what happens when I ramble. I say things like I left my classroom during class, which you're not really supposed to do as a teacher. Um Trust me, I wouldn't have done it if I thought there was any issues. Okay, I, I, I knew I knew what was going on. I knew I knew I knew, that, I knew my timing. So uh, I feel like I need to explain myself a little better. Uh, so anyway, I love you guys. Hope you enjoyed this. <clears throat> Hope you watched it. Hope you made it all the way to the end. This wasn't the most impactful of lessons. I didn't really get on much of my really passionate points about this, but they're coming. Trust me. The next two days are going to be rough. So have a great Wednesday, guys. I love each of you, and I hope you're having a uh, you know, safe time at home. All right. Y'all have a great day.